Welcome back. Tom Harbin here with you. I was uh, reminded of Milton Mayer's book, They Thought They Were Free, by a piece that I saw in uh, Tablet Magazine. Uh, tabletmag.com is the website. And the title of it is uh, What to Do About Trump, the Same Thing My Grandfather Did in 1930s Vienna. Uh, this is uh, Neil Leib Leibovitz uh, wrote this. His, his uh, grandfather survived the Nazis. And uh, uh, his grandfather was Jewish, as is, is Neil, uh, Lyle, excuse me, Lyle Leibovitz. And I, you know, I, I just want, I wanted to share with you a little bit of what he wrote and then a little bit of what Milton Mayer wrote. Milton Mayer, uh, of course, was the uh, Chicago Sun, or, as I recall, reporter in the 1940s and 50s, who after World War II went over to Germany and uh, befriended 10 average Germans, people who didn't, you know, they didn't, they weren't members of the Nazi party. They didn't, they didn't fight in the war. They did, they, you know, one guy was a baker, one guy was a college professor, one guy was a bricklayer. They're, you know, there's just a bunch of, you know, people who just, they just worked through the war and said, you know, how could you have let this happen? And so let me, let me start with, with what Lyle Leibovitz uh, wrote. Uh, this was uh, last November, uh, November 14th, he wrote this. This would be, um, you know, the week after Donald Trump was elected. Okay, and that's, that's an important contextual point. Uh, so, you know, what do we do about Trump? He asks, and he, and he tells the story about his grandfather, Siegfried, and, and uh, you know, some, some nice, you know, little background story. And then, and then he gets to, you know, how we should respond to Trump. He said the first most obvious, he's talking about these three principles. And uh, he, he said the first and most obvious is this, treat, well, in fact, let me, let me uh, back up a little bit. He says, uh, I'm not sharing this particular story at this particular point in time to make some sort of historical analogy. Those, those are rarely useful, even under the best of circumstances, and to compare Donald Trump to the Fuhrer or his ascent to the rise of the Third Reich is an absurd and reprehensible proposition. But I've been thinking a lot about my grandfather's story this past week, and I find three simple commandments I can't bring myself to dismiss. And I'm, I'm bringing this up now in the context of Sean Spicer, yesterday making the comment that Hitler didn't gas his people. I, you know, now, I, I think we all know the, what Sean Spicer was trying to say was that, that uh, to the extent that there are rules of engagement in, in war, that Hitler was following those rules of engagement. Obviously, you know, that completely writes off the Holocaust, you know, which is, which is insane. And it's why Sean Spicer is running around this morning. Um, you know, he's not just eating crow, he's, he's, gobbling every crow in sight, uh, and, and appropriately so. But the, the reason, I think, why people so reacted so strongly to Spicer making what was essentially a stupid comment is because there has been so much, uh, if not outright Holocaust denial, um, at least... Uh, you know, sales pitches, you know, race and religion-based sales pitches coming out of this administration, uh, you know, anti-Muslim, um, arguably anti-Semitic, um, you know, uh, Holocaust Remembrance Day, not even mentioning the Jewish people. I mean, things like this, that uh, this administration is is suspect. And so, you know, when they say things, it's like, so anyhow, these, what are these three principles that uh, Lyle Leibovitz says? He says, the first and most obvious is this, treat every poisoned word as a promise. When a bigoted blusterer tells you he intends to force members of a religious minority to, re to register with the authorities, believe him. Don't try to be clever. Don't lean on political intricacies or legislative minutia or historical precedents for comfort and don't write it off as propaganda. Do that, and a second principle follows closely. You should treat people like adults and demand that they understand the consequences of their actions. That would be the Trump supporters and the media. He says, don't waste any time then trying to understand. Voters are all adults. They made their choice, and it is now you who must brace for impact. Remember that what matters now isn't analysis, it's survival. Then he says, which leads me to the third principle, the one hardest to grasp. 
refuse to accept what's going on as the new normal. Not now, not ever. In the months and years to come, keep in mind, this was written, you know, the week after Trump's election. In the months and years to come, decisions will be made that may strike you as perfectly sound. Appointments announced that are inspired and policies enacted you may even like. Friends and pundits will reach out to you and invoking nuance, urge you to admit that there's really nothing to fear and things are more complex and nothing is ever black or white. Perfectly sound argument, of course, but it's also dead wrong, writes Lyle Leibovitz. This isn't about policy or appointments or even about outcomes. This isn't a political contest. It's a moral crisis. When an inexperienced, thin-skinned demagogue rides into office by explaining away immensely complex problems while arguing that our national glory demands we strip millions of their dignity or their rights, our only duty is to resist by whatever means permitted us by law. The demagogue may boost the economy, he may sign beneficial treaties, he may mend our bailing institutions, but his success can never be ours. The only thing that matters now is that simple moral truth. This isn't right. So that's, those are just some excerpts. You, you, know, get, you can read the whole thing at tabletmag.com. Um, and uh, the, the article by Lyle, uh, L-E-I-L-I-E-L Leibovitz, uh, L-E-I-B-O-V-I-T-Z. Milton Mayer uh, was uh, quoting in his book, They Thought They Were Free, uh, he was, he, he's quoting a story told to him by a college professor in Germany who, who taught through World War II, as, you know, to, and he wasn't teaching politics. He, as, as, a, as I recall, he was teaching science. And this college professor, uh, you know, uh, Mayer is like, you know, how could you have, you know, not done so? You know, what, what happened to you? And the guy says, this separation of government from people this widening of the gap took place so gradually and so insensibly, each step disguised, perhaps not even intentionally, as a temporary emergency measure or associated with true patriotic alliance, allegiance, or with real social purposes. And all the crises and reforms, and some were real reforms, so occupied the people that they did not see the slow motion underneath, or the whole process of government growing remoter and remoter. To live in this process is absolutely not to be able to notice it. Please try to believe me, unless one has a much greater degree of political awareness, acuity, than most of us ever had the occasion to develop. Each step was so small, so inconsequential, so well explained, or on occasion regretted, that unless one were detached from the whole process from the beginning, unless one understood what the whole thing was in principle, what all these little measures that no patriotic German could resent was, must someday lead to, one no more saw it developing from day to day and a farmer in his field sees the corn growing, and one day it's over his head. And you look at these, at, at, at these uh, uh, outcomes, and the, there was a great piece apropos of this. There was this great piece published uh, by uh, Snarkoleptic over at Democratic Underground um, back uh, on, on March 9th. And it, it was from a high school civics book, 1948, the Gruder's classic American government textbook, page one, right? And it's, it's two lists, a list on the left, a list on the right. And the list on the left is without government. The list on the right is with government. In other words, what is the purpose of government? And, you know, with, without government, no adequate protection of life, no adequate protection of family, no adequate protection of property, property no adequate protection of country. With government, police, laws, courts, army, navy, air force. Without government, under sanitation and health, polluted water, filth and waste everywhere, tubercular milk, disease unchecked, home treatment for diseases, impure foods, dangerous drugs. With government, this is a civics book from 1948. With government, pure water systems, sewer systems, inspected milk, health services and regulation, public hospitals, pure food and drug laws. Education. Without government, private schools for the, unre for, the unre for the few, unrestricted child labor, and private libraries. With government, free education, compulsory education, and public libraries. Roads and con conservation. Without government, private mud roads, wasted minerals, forests burned or destroyed, pollution of fishing streams, soil erosion unchecked. With government, highways, rail and air control. Mining regulations, reforestation and fire patrols, fish and game regulations, soil conservation. Protections for business and labor. Without government, 
dishonest and unfair practices, insecure banks, long hours at low wages, dangerous working conditions. With government, again, this is, this is a, an elementary school civics book from 1948. With government, regulation of corporations and unions, inspection of de and, and deposit insurance, minimum wages and hours, safety and sanitary regulations. And, you know, it goes on relief, liberty, civilization. Civilization without government would perish. Civilization with government needs honesty and efficiency. And uh, liberty without government, oppression by the strong and the shrewd. With government, civil rights protected by the law. I mean, this is just, just fundamental stuff. But what we're seeing is, and, it, and we're seeing it being normalized. And this is the thing that concerns me is the bizarre nature of the Trump administration, where Jeff Sessions lies to Congress, where Tom Price lies to Congress, where, where uh, Scott Pruitt lies to Congress, all these guys, uh, you know, where, where Gorsuch, you know, in his confirmation hearings, won't even say that child labor, uh, you know, was, a, was a, you know, ending child labor was an appropriate Supreme Court decision. We're, this is such a not normal administration. It is such a not normal time that, you know, like, like you know, so many people are responding the way that, that, that Milton Mayer's friend did, uh, you know, in, in Germany, saying, well, you know, how do we know? You know, he's, he's, he says, Pastor Niemöller spoke for the thousands and thousands of men like me when he spoke too modestly of himself and said that, you know, when the Nazis attacked the communists, he was a little uneasy, but after all, he was not a communist, and so he did nothing. Then they attacked the socialists, and he was a little uneasier, but still he wasn't a socialist. He did nothing. And then the schools and the press and the Jews and so on. And he was always uneasier, but still he did nothing. And then they attacked the church, and he was a churchman, but then it was too late for him. He says, you, you see, one doesn't see exactly where or how to move. Believe me, this is true. Each act, each occasion is worse than the last, but only a little worse. You wait for the next and the next. You wait for the one great shocking occasion, thinking that others, when such a shock comes, will join you in resisting. Yeah, it's, it's, it's just uncertainty is the great factor.